Morning, church. He has risen. Amen. Amen. What a great day. It's so it's so awesome just to see everybody here. Gosh, man. Gosh, it's great seeing you, my friend. Long time. Oh, but it's uh, it's just a joyous time. I mean, this is a time of year that uh, Christians celebrate even more than uh, Christmas, believe it or not, right? I mean, because this is the day the Lord has has resurrected. Uh, he's raised from the dead. He has given us hope where there was no hope. And uh, praise God. Praise God. Um, I'm going to get into the announcements today. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Lake, uh, to Lakeland Bible Church. I'm Pete Weigler. Um, so uh, before we get started, I do want to call out one thing. As, as a tradition, as our leadership has always been, we've uh, never broken tradition on forgetting anniversaries and important dates. And we haven't broken that tradition yet because we did miss April 1st was Pastor's and Susan's anniversary here at Lakeland Bible Church back on April 1st and that's no not a joke that's not an April 1st joke how many years April yeah 31 31 years we okay of COVID, so. there you go 31 years so again um, if uh, but that don't fret I mean if you uh, want to uh, give a special gift to Pastor Mike uh, there's always the offering um, a box in the back that you can just write a, uh, a, a check out to him and designate it to Pastor Mike, and we'll make sure that he gets that gift. Um, so anyway, just wanted to call that out. Thank you, Pastor, for all the service and just being a true friend. You know, just really appreciate it. Um, so Tuesday, we got uh, ment Men Mentoring Men uh, coming up, still the con uh, continued study on uh, studying cults. Wednesday, we have uh, Pastor uh, still doing his... Um, online video as far as the study of the names of God and something additional. On Wednesday morning, he's going to begin the prayer, me prayer meetings Wednesday, uh, beginning, oh, I'm sorry, that's starting on April 14th. So you did that to me again. That's supposed to be in next week's announcements. All right, at 10 a.m. So again. <laughs> All right, so anyway, uh, so again, he, he's going to be starting that again uh, uh, next Wednesday, but this Wednesday, please join him online on Facebook with uh, the continued study on um, uh, names of God. Uh, this Friday, of course, we have the men's Bible study. Uh, going to be joining uh, Mr. Walt over at Brits, and, um, and, and again, I wish I could join. It's just I wish my work schedule would uh, cooperate, but well, we'll get there. One day we'll get there. Uh, we do have a workday cookout scheduled for April 17th at 10 a.m. Uh, that's a Saturday. Uh, if you guys uh, can spare some time, we would really, really appreciate it. There's a lot of things that need to happen around the church to maintain this building. A uh, few things, if you, if you go in and you see, like, out of order on certain uh, <laughs> facility things, you know, in the men's room and such, these are the things that need some help, okay? So uh, we could certainly use some help there, um, and if you have some time, an hour or two to spare on Saturday, April 17th, would really appreciate it, starting at 10 a.m. There will be a lunch at 1 p.m., so for those that just hang out longer, uh, we will have uh, lunch. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the back so we can get a head count because we're going to order uh, some pizza and stuff, you know, so. Um, oh, you're going to cook on the grill? Oh, okay. Well, there you go. But we still need that sign-up sheet, uh, your name on it. Um, evangelism class. Uh, again, if anybody that's uh, before COVID, we had a uh, sign-up sheet in the back, were interested, then uh, COVID hit, and then everything got torpedoed and got messed up. So now we are trying to start that up again. If you are interested in uh, learning evangelism, uh, pastor is going to be starting up a class. Please uh, put your name in the back. We appreciate that. Um, a reminder on tithing, uh, you can always mail your tithes to LBC PO Box 7212, Lakeland, Florida 33807. Uh, there's also the option of using cash apps, which is our online giving, is 863-209-2280. Or you could also use our webpage, uh, it's uh, lakelandbiblechurch.org, and there's a link on there for Tidely. You can just click on that link and follow the instructions. Or if you're here today, there's a box in that, so you can just slip that right in the box there and we'd really appreciate that uh birthdays coming up we have 
Today is a special day for two people. Miss Susan, happy birthday. And Jodell, happy birthday. And then uh, Leona, we have uh, her birthday coming up on the 11th. I don't see Leona today, but, oh, yeah, that's on the, oh, is that, that that's next Sunday, I'm sorry, yes, you're right, on the 11th. And then anniversaries coming up, uh, Jodell and Melissa, happy anniversary coming up on the 7th. So, all right, and so without further ado, I am going to postpone what we had on normally do when I talk about the, um, the hun- uh, 100 uh, facts in the Bible uh, as far as, you know, how science has proven that uh, of those biblical uh, items in the Bible. Um, and I'm going to switch your attention to prophecies filled by Jesus for today, okay? So what I wanted to do, you know, I kind of wanted to, you know, give a little study, try to figure out, you know, um, all right, so, you know, maybe I should cover just the part, portion of where, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection, right? Just the prophecies there. Maybe I can limit the amount because truth be told, his entire life, he fulfilled at least 100 prophecies. So, if you think about that, and you think about movies like Lord of the Rings and stuff like that, what do they fulfill, like one? They're making a big deal about one prophecy coming true, right? Try a hundred by one man, one lifetime. I mean, that's astounding, just crazy. So I was saying, okay, I'm, we'll limit, we'll pare it down, we'll get down to just the Jesus, death and resurrection. Try 39, just in Jesus' death and resurrection. So I was like, wow. And some of these prophecies were foretold 1,200 years before the birth of Jesus. I mean, that's astounding. I mean, just minus 1,200 years from 2021. They just kind of give you an idea how, how long ago that was, right? You think about that. Those prophecies were foretold 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, and he fulfilled those prophecies. So I'm not going to dwell on going into each one of them. You guys are probably very happy on that because there's 39 of them. But just bear with me because I'm going to read them off to you and just meditate and just think about that. So one, be Passover sacrifice with no broken bone. Be hung upon a tree as a curse for us. Number three, being thirsty during his execution. Number four, be accused by false witnesses. Number five, be struck on the head. Number six, have hands and feet pierced. Number seven, have soldiers cast lots for his coat. Number eight, be given gall and vinegar, that's sour wine. Number nine, be beaten and spat upon. Number 10, be betrayed by a friend. Number 11, be despised and rejected. Number 12, be accused and afflicted but did not open his mouth. Number 13, commit his spirit into God's hand. Number 14, be buried with the rich. Number 15, be numbered, which is crucified, with transgressors. Number 16, 30 pieces of silver to buy a potter's field. Number 17, be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Number 18, be Passover lamb without blemish, slain with blood, applied as protection from judgment. Number 19, be lifted up, just as Moses lifted up a serpent. Number 20, be raised from the dead. Number 21, conquer death through his resurrection. Number 22, feel forsaken by God. Number 23, be mocked and insulted by many. By number number 24, friends stand afar. Number 25, ascend on high. Number 26, reproaches of others fall on him. Number 27, another to succeed, uh, succeed Judas. Number 28, be a son who is given. Number 29, swallow up death in victory. Number 30, be mistreated, hardly recognized. Number 31, be our, be our griefs and carry our sorrows. Number 32, be wounded for our transgressions. Number 33, be led as a lamb to the slaughter. Number 34, be sinless without guile. Number 35, make intercession for the transgressors. Number 36, be made into an offering for sin. Number 37, be cut off at a specific time after Jerusalem wall was rebuilt, before the temple is destroyed. 
Number 38, his body would be pierced. And number 39, a shepherd smitten and his sheep scattered. It's quite a list. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Pastor. And uh, I just pray that you would um, just reflect upon the Lord and just the amazing blessings that he has given us with his um, selfless act of, se- of uh, sacrifice and then his uh, resurrection, which, which we celebrate today. So, Pastor? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Walt. Hallelujah. <laughs> if we could, I, I would just like to take a minute, um, a little bit of sanctified imagination, if, if, if we could, and put ourselves in Mary and Martha's place, standing before Lazarus's grave and telling Jesus, oh, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And his words... And we can all take them to heart. I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he who dies will never die, but will have everlasting life. But I just had to think of what a beautiful prequel to this resurrection morning when Christ arose from his grave, when he said, Lazarus, come forth. And here's Lazarus getting to do something that the majority of us will not do. He was born twice, and he died twice. (laughs) And that first death, when Christ said, Lazarus, come forth, (laughs) I mean, I can just imagine Lazarus letting his two sisters know, guess what? No big deal, (laughs) because like the thief on the cross, when Christ told him, today you will be with me in paradise. So the moment these mortal eyes close, our spiritual eyes will open to be with him forever. (laughs) And again, hallelujah. Shall we pray? Our Father, we do thank you for this day. It is the day we remember Father, the the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that death could not hold him. And Father, we thank you that, that you have granted to everyone who believes everlasting life. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity today to just reflect on that blessing that every sin was laid on him. Father, we cannot say or think, Lord, I just have too many sins to come to Jesus because he took every one on him that day. And so I thank you, Father, for the complete cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I just pray that anyone who might not even now think that they can't come because of the amount of weight on their souls, Father, I just pray that they would realize that coming to Jesus is a moment of realizing we can't do it, but that we can do all things through Christ who cleanses us. Lord, I thank you for that cleansing blood of Christ, and I just pray that today, as there are many who are worshiping and thanking God for this day, I pray that your word will go forth. Lord, it will just uh, just change hearts today, and souls and spirits will be will be lifted and and many more souls will come into the kingdom today for you are not willing lord that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life so we thank you we just rejoice father to know that our names are written in the lamb's book of life and absolutely nothing and no one can erase it so we thank you for that today and we just bless your name and thank you for what you're going to do as we yield our wills to yours. And we thank you in Christ's blessed and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Walter. Good morning, everyone. Hey, Rod. Good to see you, bud. 
We'll let the children be dismissed now, and uh, before I begin, I want to just make a plug again for, there's still a few more books. If you're going to sign up for the uh, evangelism class, these would be good tools for you. Uh, I do want to share something here. This is uh, one of the things that I discovered about Mark Cahill is he, he loves Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and most good preachers love him too. This has always been one of my favorite quotes, but he, uh, he can be very convicting sometimes. But listen, listen to what he says here. It's from chapter 7. It says, say what? If sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. It's just a very strong and powerful exhortation for us who are believers to share our faith with others. He says that the number one reason people don't share their faith is that they are afraid of being rejected. Um, and of course, that's true. I have to say that the, sometimes when I had opportunities to share my faith, that was one of the reasons. I was a little bit anxious about it, and I chickened out. And I'm sure many of you may have had the same experience. But then he says, number two, the next biggest reason that people don't share their faith is that they don't know how to. So, that's a good reason for you to sign up for the class. So we don't have a set time when we're going to do the class yet. We wanted to get people to sign up for it first before we, and then we'll get together, everybody that signs up, and then we'll find, try to find a good, appropriate time when it would be beneficial for everybody to sign up. So, anyway, there's still a few more books back there I want to encourage you to Pick one up. They're free for your taking. Take some tracks with you. Uh, carry them around with you. Get them out at restaurants. Put them in when you pay your bills. Put them, you know, use them. And uh, share your faith that way until you learn how to talk about it. Give them something to read about it. So anyway, let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be looking at the impact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Alfred Ackley was born in Pennsylvania in 1887. His father sent him to New York City to study music because he showed great promise as a musician. From there, he went to the Royal Academy in London where he became an accomplished musician playing the cello and the piano. But he was called to ministry. And so when he came back to America, he went to Westminster Seminary in Maryland and he eventually became a pastor in 1914 and he wrote a lot of hymns and played music and he even engaged in some evangelistic meetings with a well-known evangelist named Billy Sunday but he was most well known for uh, a famous hymn that had become a tradition among conservative evangelical Christians on one occasion he was trying to witness to a young Jewish student who asked him a question and said, why should I worship a dead Jew? Ackley tried to explain to him and convince him, saying, well, he lives, I tell you. He's not dead, but he lives here and now. Jesus Christ is more alive today than ever before, and I can prove it by my own experience, as well as the testimony of countless others. Now, later on, he says that that comment by that young man laid heavy on his heart as he was preparing a sermon for Easter Sunday. And he woke up that Sunday morning and he turned on the radio to hear a liberal preacher speaking about Easter Sunday. And he was shocked when he heard this man say, you know, it really doesn't matter to me if Christ be risen or not. His body could have turned to dust long ago in some Palestinian tomb. But what's important is that his truth is marching on. Ackley got really disturbed and he started yelling at the radio and he said, that's a lie. He lives. He's alive, I tell you. He's not dead, but he lives here and now. Jesus Christ is more alive today than ever before. I can prove it by my own experience as well as the testimony of countless thousands. And he said that morning he was fired up and he preached on the truth of the resurrection with such power and conviction like he'd never preached before. He just couldn't get the words of that young Jewish student and that liberal preacher out of his mind, though. It just kept weighing on him. And uh, 
as he was talking about it to his wife, as wives often like to do, she uh, told her husband, why don't you do something about it? So anyway, he went to the scriptures. He turned to the passage in Mark, <clears throat> and he read the part about Christ's resurrection, and the words, he lives, stuck out, and he began to write. And as he wrote, the words began to flow from his pen. And in moments, he was sitting at his piano, writing, putting together the music to the words that he had written to this well-known hymn. Oh, I went the wrong way. Oops. He lives. You know it well. So sing it with me, because it really, I just think it wouldn't be Easter if we didn't sing this him, all right? So we're going to sing it without music, though. So sing with me. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Good, not bad, y'all. Well, last year, we were shut down and... It was like one of the, it was like the first or the second message that we did on Facebook. By the way, welcome to all of you who are watching on Facebook. Um, but the message was titled, Why I Believe the Resurrection of Jesus Christ is a Historical Fact. And I presented some pretty substantial evidence that I think is um, irrefutable and provable by the rules of evidence that are used in any court of law today. Because the reason I wanted to share that as a message, because I want all of us as believers to understand <clears throat> why the resurrection is so important. What do I believe and why do I believe it? Because it makes all the difference in the world. One of the things that Peter mentioned was the importance of the resurrection. It is even more important than Christmas, because Christmas doesn't mean anything without the resurrection. And a lot of people just don't seem to think that it really matters. Friday, I read a, an article that was uh, written last week, as a matter of fact, titled, What Do Americans Actually Believe About the Resurrection? It was written for Lifeway Research, which, which is the publishing uh, wing of the Southern Baptist Convention, I believe. But according to the survey that they did in 2020, they said that 66% of Americans um, believe in the resurrection. Now, I was kind of surprised by that number, um, that that many people believe in the biblical account of the physical resurrection. That kind of presents a good news, bad news scenario for me. Um, good news, because it's really a whole lot more people than I thought, but it's bad news in... Uh, in the sense that if there's that many people that believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, why does it make that much difference in their lives? If that many people believe that there's a living Savior and they put their faith in him, why isn't it making a difference? Why don't we see it being lived out in their lives? Because in the first century, the people that came to be believers, the first 120 people that saw the resurrected Christ, and, and believed in his resurrection and were indwelt by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they went out and they turned the world upside down. They went out, they made a difference. And they couldn't be stopped. Now, obviously, I, I'm surrounded by a lot of people who believe in the resurrection, and you're indwelt by the same Holy Spirit that I am and that they were, or else you probably wouldn't be here. Um, but uh, 
And I hope that those of you that are watching, that you have a sure faith and belief in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. So I want us to think about the impact of the resurrection this morning. Why is it so important? What difference does it make in our lives? If it really happened, does it make a difference? Is it relevant? Because after all, we live in a world and a culture that seeks relevance. If it's not relevant to my life, then why do I need it? One of the primary reasons that people don't go to church today, and even why many professing Christians don't seem to attend church that much anymore, is because they don't see that it's relevant anymore to their lives. And sometimes preachers, they, they will do all kinds of gymnastics and stunts to try to get people to come to church, trying to make the Bible relevant. And loved ones, I want you to understand, it's not my job to make the Bible relevant. The Bible is relevant. It's my job to preach it and teach it in a way that you can understand it and see yourself that it's relevant. I need to present it to you in such a way that you can understand what the Bible says and teaches because it is relevant for all of us, for life. And I'm here to tell you that there is nothing more relevant than this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the most relevant text in scripture that you can find. Because when we embrace that wonderful truth by faith, it changes us on the inside. We exchange our sin for Christ's righteousness. And the Bible says that if any man is in Christ, we are new creations. We're not the same anymore. He gives us a new heart and he changes our lifestyle and our relationships and our attitudes and our speech and our priorities. And everything that we believe, everything that we think, everything that we say, and everything that we do will be connected to the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. By the way, if you notice, we have bulletins again. And that's our memory verse. Those two verses are not that much to remember, two verses. But... One of the, one of the uh, teaching tools about evangelism is Bible memorization. Because when we share the gospel, we need to remember that the power is in God's word. It's, it's not my ability to convince somebody that, that Jesus Christ can save them. But it's the gospel that has the power. And so I can share the word of God if you remember Billy Graham, the most famous evangelist that ever lived, you listen to any one of his messages and probably about 20 or 30 times in any sermon that he ever preached, he'll say over and over and over again, the Bible says. So the power is in God's word. And if your life hasn't changed, then maybe your faith isn't real. Maybe you're trusting in the wrong thing. Because I, like, like Ackley, I, I, I just remember when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, he changed my life. I mean, I'm not perfect by any means. You guys know that. You've known me long enough to know that I've got plenty of warts and failures. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for him for five years. <laughs> he saw some things. He said, Pastor Mike. <laughs> but but I'm not what I used to be. But praise God, I, I, I'm not what I'm going to be yet either. He's still working on me. That's why, that's why I clung to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I'm confident of this very thing that he that began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He started something 42 years, wow, 42 years ago. April 1979. I, you know, I'm not sure of the exact date. I think it was April 1st, too. I, I hope God's not into April Fool's jokes. But, 
but, uh, but he changed my life. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, is a new creation. And so that passage of scripture is about as relevant as the Bible can get. So I want to talk about the impact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to show you how incredibly needful this truth is. Because if the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't really happen, then my friends, we may as well pack it up and go home right now. There's no sense in us being here. We could go one of two directions from this. We could go in a negative direction or a positive direction. We could look at Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 12 through 20 because when he wrote that letter, there were some people that had come along and they had tried to convince these Christians in Corinth that there was no such thing as a resurrection. And so he gives some arguments and he says, all right, so what happened? You know, what's the conclusion here? If no resurrection ever takes place, then what, what do we conclude? And he gives a list of things. First of all, if there's no such thing as a resurrection, then Christ is still dead. And, and what good is a dead Savior? And our preaching is vain. It's useless. I'm wasting my time up here. Our faith is useless. You're wasting your time coming here. Fourthly, we're liars because we all believe he's risen and we tell people he's risen. Then we're still in our sins. What do we do when we stand before a holy God if there's no such thing as a resurrection? If Jesus is still dead. Then what about the ones that have gone on before us? I mean, we all want to believe that our loved ones are with Jesus right now. But if there's no resurrection, then there's no hope for them either. And then last of all, he says, if we believe in a resurrection, we are, most, of all people, most miserable for believing such a lie. So that's a, good, that's a good outline, and that'll preach. But that's not the direction we're going, so that's, that's not my sermon today. Maybe we'll do that next week. But uh, I just wanted to demonstrate to you how critical the doctrine of the resurrection is. If we don't believe in the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then this whole thing we call Christianity is a waste of time. What I want to do today is talk about the impact from a positive pers perspective, because it is true. What are some of the relevant consequential truths about the resurrection? If it is true, what are the logical results? So the first thing I want you to realize is that if the resurrection really did happen, then it confirms the veracity, that means truthfulness, the veracity and authority of scriptures. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The Old Testament has several passages that pointed to Christ's resurrection. Pete listed a whole bunch of Old Testament prophecies about the Lord Jesus. But here's one that goes back even farther than he went, going back 2,000 years to the days of Abraham. Abraham was commanded by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, on the altar at Mount Moriah. And uh, Abraham was going to do it. He had his hand raised with a knife in hand, and he was going to obey the Lord. And just as he was ready to bring that knife down, God stopped him. Don't slay your son, Abraham, because now I know that you love me. Well, in Abraham's mind, Isaac was already dead. But God had made a promise to Abraham years earlier and said that I'm going to make you a great nation and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your son Isaac. So Abraham, by faith, believed God. So he had to believe that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead if he did, if he did kill him. So he had exercised his faith by being obedient. And so Genesis chapter 22, the whole incident in Genesis chapter 22 was a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, 
Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Referring to the fact that Abraham looked ahead by faith that God was going to send a lamb. He actually told his son Isaac, he said, my son, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Just kind of a, a vague reference that one day God would supply a lamb as a sacrifice. Jonah also, another type. For as Jonah was in three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12, 40. When Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 13. We'll be looking at this in a couple of weeks when they're on their first missionary journey. But he says, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he, always sa he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. He quoted Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7, and again, Psalm 16 and verse 10. Psalms that were written a thousand years before the Lord Jesus. One more passage. Jesus has already been resurrected, and you know the story, the two disciples from Emmaus, they're, everybody's thinking that Jesus is dead, they didn't know he's alive yet, and they're going back home, they've left Jerusalem, Passover's over. And uh, verses 44 through 47 says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so you see, the resurrection actually confirms that the word of God is true, that the Old Testament is the authoritative scriptures given to us by God. It is the revelation from God to man. And so if that being the case, we can trust everything that it says. It's true. What it says about a risen Savior is true. And we can believe it when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ and we obey it it will change your life and it will show us how we can fulfill God's purpose in creating us so that we can bring him glory and discover all the blessings that come to us through the Lord Jesus Christ this new life that he gives us the second Thing I want to mention. It declares the divinity of Jesus by an act of divine power. Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4, Paul opens up his letter with this. And he says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Again, just another confirmation of the authority of Scripture here. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the, to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The fact that God raised up his Son from the dead should not leave a question in anybody's mind as to who he is. Declared to be the Son of God. If you're wondering what makes Jesus different from any, other, any of the other so-called deities that we find in the world, it's the resurrection. Buddhists, all the other gods that are worshipped, they're all dead gods. They can't answer your prayers. All the founders of other world religions like Muhammad or Buddha or Joseph Smith, they're all dead. It's his resurrection by the miraculous demonstration of his ability to conquer death. He established beyond a reasonable doubt that he is the son of God, God the son. 
Charles Spurgeon again, he, he said this. He said, in his human nature, he is a man of royal race, of the seed of David. He was a man, therefore he died. But he rose again, for he was more than a man declared to be the Son of God with power. He is as much the Son of God as he was the Son of Man. The humanity is as true as the divinity. The divinity as true as the humanity. So simply put, the resurrection is the proof for us that Jesus is the Son of God, even as he claimed to be. That was the reason why they wanted him crucified. He was committing blasphemy. He makes himself to be God. Then thirdly, it validates everything Jesus said and did. His teaching, his healing ministries, they were all geared to reveal who the Father was. They were geared to teach truth about the kingdom of God and to teach his disciples and proclaim to Israel that he was the promised Messiah. And, but that he first had to die as a sacrifice so that sinful men might be redeemed to have a relationship with the Father. He let them know that his earthly kingdom and his heavenly kingdom, they were yet future. He tried to reveal that to them. You remember last week we saw as he rode into the city of Jerusalem and he wept and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you had known this is your day. But, but you rejected me. But he told us how to love one another, how to serve one another, how to have peace and joy in life, and how to know that our sins are forgiven and to receive the gift of eternal life. So the fact that he conquered death validates everything that he said and everything that he did. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke 9 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He said that. Now, obviously, the Pharisees rejected that, but at this time, even his disciples didn't get it. But when Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit, it was the Father saying amen by raising him up from the grave. In other words, the resurrection was the Father's stamp of approval that what Jesus did on the cross in paying for the sins of mankind was accepted by him. He became the propitiation. That word propitiation means satisfaction. The required payment for all of our sin, the debt, was eternal punishment. But when he hung on the cross, he bore the penalty for all of our sin in his own body as he hung on the tree. And God accepted it. And so the resurrection is God's amen to what he did for us. So that means that you can trust everything he said. Every promise is sure. And he said that by believing him, you could have eternal life. And you can be absolutely confident that it's true. Fourthly, it separates the Christian faith from all other religions. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He declared that the only way to God was through him. Now, had he not raised from the dead, that would have just meant that he would have been just another way like all the others claimed to be. And there would have been no real authority to anything that he said or did. But the resurrection is what sets him apart from all the other pretenders. They're all false. He's the only one that rose from the grave. All the others are impotent face. Islam offers no such hope. Neither does Hinduism or Judaism or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Buddhism or any other religious faith. Tuesday night, we're, we've been looking at all these different beliefs with our men's study group. This Tuesday, we're going to start looking at Islam. It's making some inroads all over the world. 
Even in the Christian church, there's, there's a thing called Chrislam, where they're mixing Islamic beliefs into Christianity. The story is told of a Muslim in Africa. He became a Christian, and some friends asked him on one occasion, why have you done such a thing? And he said, well, it's like this. He says, suppose you were going down a road, and suddenly you came to a fork, and uh, you didn't know which way to go. But at that fork, there were two men, one dead and the other one alive. Which one would you ask for directions? That's pretty simple. Number five, it secures our salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. If the cross is all there is to the gospel, then it was all for nothing. Christ's suffering and death would not have accomplished a thing. He would have just been a martyr, a religious martyr. Would have been a tragic execution of a Jewish rabbi who claimed to be a messiah. He wouldn't have been able to secure salvation for anybody cross of Christ has eternal significance for those who put their trust in his substitutionary death but it is only because three days later he rose from the grave Romans chapter 4 verse 24 and 25 says it speaking of his righteousness in the context there if you want to look at it later but the word the pronoun it refers to righteousness shall be imputed imputed means just simply to place on your account shall be imputed to us who believe in him and raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. He was raised up so that we could be justified. We could be declared righteous. That's what justification is all about. I'm declared righteous now before a holy God. Now, again, I'll mention it. You guys know I'm not perfectly righteous. But I'm declared righteous. I have the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to me. It's been placed on my account. And God sees me now, not with this sinful flesh that I have, but he sees me dressed, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Absolutely perfect. That's what grace is all about. I don't deserve it. God in his mercy gave it to me. According to Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So not only, you not only have to believe that he died, but also that he lives. If you don't believe Jesus Christ is living, you can't be saved. That simple. Paul told the Corinthian church that if the resurrection were false, like I said earlier, if it was a lie or a hoax or there's some other belief that it was a mass hallucination, hallucination. Um, if you don't believe that the resurrection was real, then you're not a real Christian. You won't be saved. We have no hope of salvation or forgiveness, no promise of heaven or eternal life. And all those things that I mentioned earlier just leave us hopeless and in despair. But in verse 20, at the end of that list of things that leave us destitute and hopeless, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's one of the reasons why I picked that last song. We sang, oh, happy day, happy day, he washed my sins away. I mean, that's, that's a truth that we ought to be rejoicing. You know, we meet every Sunday in recognition of his resurrection, the first day of the week. That brings us to our next point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ precedes our own resurrection and ultimate glorification. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits means that he is the first of all who will follow by virtue of believing in him. Everybody who died and rose again in the Old Testament, those who died and rose again in the New Testament, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, 
Tabitha we saw the other couple weeks ago, they all had to die again. Like Walter said, they died twice. Jesus is the first person who died and rose again, never to die again. And now, because of our faith in him, you and I will die, but we'll never die again. There's an old saying, if you are born once, you'll die twice. But if, you'll, if you're born twice, you'll die once. If you're born again, you'll only die one time. But if you're only born once and you're not born again, you're going to die twice. You're going to die the physical death like all of us will one day, unless we're here when the Lord comes. And then we'll die the spiritual death where there will be eternal separation from God. Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead because the Bible guarantees that all who believe in Jesus Christ are united by him, by, uh, with him by saving faith, and that we will be raised from the dead as well. But he is the firstborn. And, and when we are raised, we're going to be transformed and glorified. This is chapter 15. Let me encourage you to read this whole chapter. But in verses 51 through 55, he talks about what's in store for us. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. By the way, that's, that might be a good sign to put in the nursery. You, a little humor there. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means it's not going to rot and wither away like these bodies that we have now. But we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? We're going to have the same kind of incorruptible body that Jesus has now. You know, and, and remember, he was able to walk through walls, appear in rooms, and he was still able to eat too. We'll like that and not have to worry about our weight. <laughs> I like that, too, because this is the first time I've been able to button a suit in a long time. I've lost 20 pounds. Need to lose some more, though. But, you know, we, right now we're all coming to an age where we have to worry about what we eat, about exercise, and, hey, you know, the last couple of days, I've been out in the yard digging dirt and rocks and gravel for Susan. My wife's trying to kill me. <laughs> but, you know, our bodies just can't take the kind of stuff. You know, we're not made. Well, I can't, can't say we're not made for that. <laughs> but the older we get, the harder it is. So we feel these aches and pains. And there's coming a day when we're not going to feel any of these things and, and, and we're going to be pain free and uh, no more sorrow no more aches, no more death and so eye has not seen nor has ear heard or has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him we can't even imagine what awaits us when we enter into glory Number seven, it guarantees eternal life in heaven to all who believe. <clears throat> Paul opens up, or not Paul, but Peter, rather. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an eternal corru incorruptible and uh, to an inheritance, rather, incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That means that we don't have to be afraid of death. I mean, these bodies are withering away. But, you know, we're all going to die. You know, the statistics are undeniable. One out of one. Hoy Ten Boom put it this way. 
She says, in the forest fire, there is always one place where the fire cannot reach. It is the place where the fire has already burned itself out. Calvary is the place where the fire of God's judgment against sin burned itself out completely. And it is there that we are safe. If you ever get caught in a forest fire, find a place where the fire's already burned. Because you'll find refuge there because the fire won't go back there. So dear people, as frightening and as foreboding as death may seem to us, it can neither hurt us nor destroy us. The story is told about Donald Gray Barnhouse. He was a well-known preacher in the first half of the 20th century. Pastored 10th Presbyterian Church for many years in Philadelphia and uh, well known as a gifted Bible teacher, Bible expositor his wife had passed away and he had three children 12 and under and they were driving to the service when as they were driving a large truck passed by and you know, the shadow of the truck passed across the car and turning to his oldest daughter he said to her, tell me, sweetheart, would you rather be run over by that truck or by its shadow? And of course, she kind of looked at her father curiously and said, well, I guess by the shadow, because it can't hurt you. And so he said to all of his children, he said, your mother has not been overridden by death, but by the shadow of death. And that's nothing to fear. And that's the way we all need to see death. It was, um, I guess when was it, Roger, two, two weeks ago, I did a funeral. I got called in at the last moment to do a funeral for somebody that I didn't know. But that was one of the points that I wanted to make, that death is nothing to fear. But, but it is something that we need to be ready for. All of us need to prepare for it. And the first way that you prepare is by making sure that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you, that you believe that he died for your sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again, and you embrace that truth, and then you don't have to worry about dying. You, you're, you're ready whenever it happens. You know, none of us are guaranteed the next minute. And because it is the reality that every one of us face, we must all be ready for it. Look at how that's phrased again. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, and are kept by the power of God. There's no greater power in the universe. If I'm kept by the power of God, what have I got to worry about? Number eight, it supplies us with power in the Christian life. Do you think God saved you and just left, left you here to flounder, kind of flop along, you know, try to get along in life the best you can? You know, I, I've talked to so many people through the years who just, that's their excuse for their failures. Well, I'm doing the best I can, Pastor. God doesn't want you to do the best you can. He wants you to realize that you can't do it. Trying to live the Christian life on your own is impossible. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now he went, he raised from the, rose from the grave... And then he went up into heaven. He said, I'm going to go to the Father, but when I go, I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be in you. He's the one that gives us newness of life. And then Paul told the Philippians, this was his passion, to know him. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. You want to know what made Paul tick? That was it. His lifelong passion was to know Jesus Christ, and that's what drove him to go out into the world and preach the gospel the way he did. He lived in the power of the resurrection. 
But he also knew the fellowship of his suffering because he suffered greatly for the gospel. And the reality is, is that if you want to know the power of the resurrection, it's going to cost you. We will have to experience the fellowship of his suffering as well. You know, I want to know Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. But if I'm ever going to be like Jesus, I have to go through some of the things that Jesus went through. And that doesn't mean I'm going to be brutally beaten and like he was. But I will be persecuted. He says, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. He says, but don't worry. It's not you that they hate. It's me that they hate. It's not you that they're persecuting. It's me that they're persecuting. And we need to kind of get that in our heads. That their animosity is geared towards them, toward Jesus, not us. We are, we are just the human representatives of the master of the universe. He prayed for the Ephesians. This is what he asked for them that you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The power of the Holy Spirit, that's what, that's what raised him from the dead. He wants that power to be resident in each of us. The power of his resurrection, because that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to every one of us. His Holy Spirit He's the eternal Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit that was present back then is the same Holy Spirit that is present with us today. And he hasn't lost his power through the years. We've just lost our confidence and trust in him through the years. We've been, as my son Tim likes to say, we've kind of been Americanized. We have an American version of Christianity, and it's kind of anemic. We're not really trusting the Holy Spirit like we should. The Christian life is God working in you and through you. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. He wants to manifest his power in you so that you can obey, you can serve, you can love, you can forgive, you can glorify God by letting Christ live his life through you. Paul said in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Christ living his life in and through him. And, and that's what we need to learn. Number nine, it provides me with a divine intercessor. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, there are times when we may wonder if we're really saved. You know, you know let's be honest. We don't all act really all that sanctified sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, we pray and... and we know that there are times that God doesn't answer our prayers because we pray with selfish motives. We're praying the wrong thing. But rest assured, we have a living Savior who is praying for us right now. And while he may not always answer my prayers because I pray with wrong motives and I pray selfishly, ask for the wrong things, I can guarantee you that there is never a prayer that goes past the Lord Jesus' lips that his father does not answer. And I remember that even before he died, he says, Father, I pray that all that you give me, I should lose none of them. And he's still praying that prayer now. As a matter of fact, the Apostle John in his first epistle, he says in chapter 2 that we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. An advocate is, is our legal representative. He's, he's like our defense attorney. He, uh, he's showing the wounds in his hands to his father and in his side. And, and he is our defense. When, when the accuser of the brethren says, ha, ha, look at Connor. Look what he did. How, how can he be a Christian? 
you know, if he was really a follower of Jesus, he, he couldn't do that. And Jesus intercedes and says, but Father, look, I paid for those sins. He may not always answer our prayers, but he will always answer his son's prayers. And then number 10. The fact that Jesus rose from the grave assures us that he's coming again someday. You know, when Jesus knew that his time was coming, and he knew that what he was going to experience was going to terrify his disciples. And so in John chapter 14, he tells them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, go, I will come again and will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise to his disciples. That he's coming back. And he's coming back to get them. Then after he was raised and ascended to the Father, Luke chapter 1, we saw this last year in the beginning when we started in Acts. Verse 9 through 11 says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's gone up, but guess what? He's coming back. And so there's ten uh, consequences, I guess, if you want to call them that that result because Jesus Christ is, in fact, raised from the grave. Like I said, it is a verifiable fact of history. There are more evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there are of the existence of Julius Caesar, if you can believe that, as far as historical written documents. He rose and he ascended with the promise of the Holy Spirit which was fulfilled. And so we have this assurance that Jesus Christ is coming back. So, do all these points make the gospel relevant enough for you? Does the resurrection make sense and does it mean something to you now? Does it excite you? Does it stir your heart? I, I hope it does. I hope it kicks us in the rear end and gets us busy serving him. Because as I have been saying, we are entering a time in our history where it seems pretty evident that Jesus Christ is probably going to be coming back someday soon. Now, you know, it still may be a thousand years because the Apostle Paul thought he was coming back in his day. That was 2,000 years ago. But, I mean, you look and see what's happening all around us, and you see the signs. I'm no date setter. But I'm not going to be surprised when I hear that trumpet. I want to stay busy. I don't want to be caught off guard. And I hope it will energize you, knowing that he's coming back. But, again, you have the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we're going to be energized. I can't do it in my own strength has to be in his and my friends if you're not willing to submit your life to the Savior then you just don't understand how relevant the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so let's pray together and we'll be dismissed we're going to sign off of Facebook but we're not going to be dismissed we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together thought it would be kind of awkward to do it on Facebook sorry folks but kind of hard to do something that was meant to do together. 
And let's pray together, and uh, we'll sign off, and then we'll celebrate. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you that your son is alive. It gives us hope. It gives us meaning. It gives us, <laughs> it just gives us strength to know that this faith that we have is real. And that this life that we live is not all that there is. But there is a, a more beautiful, more eternal more blessed existence beyond this life. But Lord, while we're here, you have charged us with the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to make the Lord Jesus Christ and his message of salvation known. So I pray that we might go forth in the power of your spirit and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and tell others that he died according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that three days later he rose again according to the scriptures. Father, use us, I pray, to make your gospel known. Thank you today for the special significance of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, as we celebrate our risen Savior. Thank you for all these things, praying together in his name. Amen. For those of you that are watching on Facebook, I want to thank you for joining us. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week. God bless.